Welcome to TOPS, the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Sam Sturm, an economics PhD student at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar today will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterward, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website at tobaccopolicy.org. I will now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Michael Darden from Johns Hopkins University to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so today we continue our summer 2024 session with uh, Grand Ron's uh, presentation by Dr. Nancy Rigotti entitled Cytosine for Tobacco Cessation, Recent Studies and Next Steps for a New and Old Drug. Uh, Dr. Nancy Rigotti is a in, uh, general internist and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School based in Massachusetts General Hospital. Her research aims to reduce the enormous global burden of tobacco-related diseases by identifying new tobacco cessation treatments and promoting tobacco treatment uh, delivery across healthcare systems. She founded and directs Mass General Hospital's Multidisciplinary Tobacco Research and Treatment Center, is past president of the Society for Research in Nicotine and Tobacco, and the Society of General Internal Medicine, uh, and is a member of the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee. For the past decade, much of her work has focused on exploring the potential of cytosine for tobacco cessation and e-cigarettes for tobacco harm reduction. Our discussant today is Dr. Ahmad El Halani, an assistant professor from the College of Public Health at The Ohio State University. Dr. Nancy Rigotti, thank you for presenting for us today. Wonderful. I'm delighted to be here and to be with you. Let me just bring my slides up onto the screen. Okay, look good? Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about cytosine today, um, which I'm very excited to do. Here are my disclosures. Um, the funding for the two papers presented today are coming from Achieve Life Sciences, which is a small pharmaceutical company based in Seattle, Washington, that has been um, working to get this drug onto the market in the United States, as well as some of the funding was from, the, from NIDA. And most of my research in the last uh, 10 years has been from NIH. And I have not uh, received money from tobacco or e-cigarette companies. Okay, so I think most of us know that there are three FDA approved smoking cessation medications, uh, nicotine replacement, bupropion, and varenicline. They've been around for a while um, and their efficacy and availability is limited. They do help, but they don't help every smoker. Medications also have side effects and costs and availability issues that can limit their use. Um, and more importantly, no medicines have been approved by the US FDA since 2006. So that's almost 20 years, I guess it's really 18. Um, but I would argue that new options are needed. I'm a physician and in the world of diabetes and hypertension, we have new medicines all the time. And we haven't had anything for smoke to, to deal with smoking, which is just as important a risk factor as all any, any of the others. So what I'd like to propose today is that we uh, consider cytosine. So you may not know about it, but it's a plant-based alkaloid. You can see a picture of how it grows on trees native to Europe. Um, it has a similar mechanism of action as varenicline. It's a partial agonist at alpha-4, beta-2 nicotinic receptors in the brain. And it's been a low cost generic smoking cessation aid used in Eastern and Central Europe for decades, since the 60s at least. Um, and there are two major companies there, one in Bulgaria and one in Poland that um, are doing, that have, uh, have the market. Um, it's 
but it had really been overlooked by those of us in smoking cessation for a long time uh, because the literature that was on it was basically in Russian and other languages that um, didn't get translated. And so it was only in 2011, which is a little more than a decade ago, that there started to be uh, uh, um, modern clinical trials and published in, in, in very accessible journals to those of us who speak English. Um, and so it's, it's available in a few countries, but not very many. Um, it did come to Canada as a natural product. It's not, it didn't go through the pharmaceutical mechanism. It went as a natural product that a pharmacist who was very entrepreneurial got on the market. Um, I learned just today that the, that Australia has now decided to let pharmacists prescribe it or, or deliver it. <clears throat> and in the UK, it was approved as a medication in January of this year. What I wanna do now is just briefly go backwards and show you the data that we have on cytosine um, from, uh, from big clinical trials. There were really two uh, major ones that were published over the last decade. The first on the left-hand side was the placebo-controlled trial of cytosine for smoking cessation done in Poland um, that followed people for uh, 12 months. It was the, the standard smoking cessation randomized controlled trial. And um, they found that there was a benefit for cytosine. The quit rates were low, but the uh, relative risk was pretty good. Um, that was followed a few years later by one uh, that was done in New Zealand by Natalie Walker and Chris Bullen, um, where they combined, compared cytosine to nicotine for smoking cessation. And they found that cytosine outperformed uh, nicotine replacement, a smaller uh, risk ratio, but still, um, uh, pretty good uh, quit rates. Um, and when the second one was about to be published, I was asked to write an editorial for the New England Journal to sort of put this into context. And I'd heard about the drug, but I didn't know a lot about it. And I got very excited about it because I thought this could be an effective new medicine for smoking cessation. I thought more important that it could be like varenicline, but a drug that smokers were not reluctant to take because of side effects or fear of of cognitive effects. And then I thought even beyond that, could this be an affordable accessible drug to help the world's smokers? Um, because what we what happens is the medicines that we have in the US, even the ones we've got, are generally not available in most of most low and middle income countries where they're just too expensive. And it seems to me that a drug, you know, that, that you could grow on a tree that would be cheap to make um, and is already a generic would be something that's very uh, desirable to have for the for public health and global health. The challenge for the U.S. it seemed to me was how could a generic medication get FDA approval? There's a long and expensive process required to get FDA approval to prove both efficacy and safety of a drug. You know how, who's going to do that if they're the pro, if they don't have um, any brand if they don't have a brand name if they don't have a uh, the the ability to to make money off of it. So and so then how could it stay low in cost? Um, I think that those are still questions that are out there, um, and maybe people on this call will have some ideas about uh, how this might happen. But in the meantime, what happened was actually a drug company decided to go after this, um, and there's a company called Achieve Life Sciences, which has been developing this drug for smoking cessation for the last decade. Um, they've been using the product that's made in Bulgaria, the same, same product. Um, they renamed it for it, their work in the U.S., call, calling it now cytosinicline instead of cytosine, uh, which is a generic product name in a category called USAN that I never heard of before, but gives it some distinction. And they've been conducting a full drug, and drug development program, and that requires a bunch of preclinical studies. And these were NIH, including the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, um, who saw this as a potential for a, a drug that was out there that, um, you know, really could make a difference. Um, and they, as a result of that, those early animal and cell studies, they were awarded an IND, which is an investigational new drug uh, category by the FDA in 2017. And uh, at that point, they could go to clinical trials. And that's at the point where I and some other colleagues 
um, began as academics to work with the company to help them develop the clinical program and conduct the studies. So the first, their first goal of the company was to say, this is a drug that's been out there, but how do we know that we're using it in the best way? And so they, they really decided to define the optimal drug treatment regimen. You know, what dose, what frequency, what duration? And the reason what got this going is that the traditional way that it's been used for all these years, including in those trials that I showed you at the beginning, was this weird weird dosing pattern that just is not like how we give other smoking cessation medicines. It was 25 days downward titration using one and a half milligram tablets from six doses a day down to one dose a day. We don't do that in smoking cessation. We usually start low to minimize side effects and go up and keep it going for like two or three months or beyond. So they, the company sort of said, you know, what could we do? I'm not gonna tell you about the pharmacokinetic studies um, that they did, but they basically did the work to show that you could take it as little as three times a day and still maintain adequate blood levels uh, that looked that looked sufficient. Um, and they then did a trial where they compared three times a day versus the six times a day and de decreasing dosing. And they found that the three times a day was more effective. Um, as and more sta as a more, as a stable dose, and then they said, well, you know, why don't we use it for more than twenty five days? Since we, since most smoking station drugs are used for more, and that sort of got going, um, their the plans for their big clinical trials. So that in negotiation with the FDA, the FDA told them that the fact that there were some nice trials done outside the United States would not suffice to get FDA approval in the US. They had to do US-based trials and they had to do two trials, two large trials um, in completely different sites. And so what they did is design um, with our help two phase three art randomized trials that compared smoking cessation efficacy of two different doses versus placebo. One was a six week dose, which was a more similar to the original dose and um, and then a 12 week dose, which allowed us to compare it directly to uh, um, because that's given for, for 12 weeks as, as well. And they're very similar mechanisms. So it, it made sense to think, of, think about that duration. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about. So this is the first one of the two that was called ORCA-2. And it, um, its goal was to test the efficacy and safety of a longer course of this new cytosinicline regimen with behavioral support in group, both groups versus placebo plus behavioral support. So the, des the design was to compare six weeks versus placebo and 12 weeks versus placebo. You see a picture of the study design here. Just to summarize, it was uh, a three-arm trial. Everybody took one pill three times a day for 12 weeks. Um, they didn't know which pill, it was, you know, what, what it was. Um, all had behavioral support at the weekly visits that were that were part of the trial. Everybody was followed for a total of 24 weeks or six months. And because of the structure of the trial, two out of three patients received active drug, which made it easier to recruit. So who was in it? Uh, you had to be an adult. You had to be a cigarette, a cigarette smoker of at least 10 cigarettes a day. Uh, you had to be willing to set a quit date pretty soon. And you had to be medically and psychiatrically stable, which meant, uh, without going into a lot of detail, that we, if you had had a recent cardiovascular event or hospitalization, uh, you were out. Uh, you were not in this trial. Or if you had serious mental illness, you were not in the trial. But sort of mild anxiety and depression, which is common, especially in smokers, didn't keep you out of the trial. And you had to have a negative drug stream. Um, although we didn't, we did not test for cannabis, but you couldn't be on other, other drugs, especially any illicit drugs. These were our outcomes. Uh, the primary outcome was defined as biochemically verified continuous uh, abstinence in the last four weeks of treatment. And it was verified with a CO of less than 10 parts per million. So there was a six week, um, arm. So that one would look at weeks three to six. That's the primary outcome for that arm. And for the other arm, the 12 week arm, it was weeks nine to 12 versus placebo. The secondary endpoint was then to look at um, how, would, if there was an effect, 
would it last through six months? And then there was a safety piece, of course, which was to look at adverse events. Um, and then the analysis was done as, as intention to treat with an assumption that missing, if, you, if the data was missing, the person was, a, was counted as a smoker standard in smoking station trials. So this was done in 17 sites uh, across the US. It was done um, during the early phases of COVID, the COVID epidemic, the first COVID run through. Um, we enrolled, this is the consort diagram, which um, I think it might be easier if you just look at the right-hand side here, to, which summarizes that we enrolled 810 people and we got good follow-up rates for this kind of work. We got an 82% completion for 12 weeks, 76% for 24 weeks. And um, uh, what's not on here, but I would like to also add is that we had um, a very good uh, retention in terms of, not retention, um, uh, adherence to study medication. So people, people took most of the medicine that they were supposed to take. They were reminded a lot, but they, they did it, they took it. Okay, so the, here is our, you know, table one to show you who were the study participants. And again, this is a lot of numbers. And so I think it's easier if we just look down this first column because, because randomization works in large numbers. And in fact, these groups were very similar. They, the average age was 52, a little more than half were women. Um, it was largely a white sample, but about 16% were African-American. Um, they were, you know, pack a day smokers roughly. Um, and what uh, what this shows you is that they had tried a lot of other things. These are not first time triers for smoking cessation. They had been through a lot of other things, including e-cigarettes. Here's our primary outcome. Um, uh, I'm gonna show you two slides. This is the one for the six week versus placebo. That's that arm versus placebo. And we're looking here at uh, past four week continuous abstinence. Um, and so for weeks three to six, it was 25% versus 4.4% cytosine versus placebo, which was highly statistically significant with an odds ratio of eight. Um, and then the secondary outcome of, you know, would it last for 24, for six months? Um, again, there was quite a bit of fall off, but still the difference was uh, statistically highly significant. Let's look now at the 12 weeks. I mean, you see the same, uh, picture, but with the 12 week data. So the 12 week uh, got a higher quit rates in both in, in both groups with um, almost a third of people being absent for the last four weeks of treatment. That was the primary outcome compared to uh, the placebo group. And that was an odds ratio of six. Um, and the secondary outcome was um, 21 versus 4.8, which is an odds ratio of five. So again, highly statistically significant um, outcomes in terms of efficacy. I also wanted to show you that this is a different way of looking at it. This is looking at, if you're looking at cross-sectional every week, you, you plot out what's the, how many, have you, you, you ask people, have you had a cigarette in the last seven days? And what you see here is clearly there's a difference between the cytosinocline groups and placebo, although they overlap a lot, especially in the first six weeks. What is interesting about this is that um, you can see that after six weeks, the shorter duration group starts to go down as, as usually happens, people start to relapse, but it continues to go up in the cytosinocline for 12 week group, which is what we've seen with varenicline at well, as well. And what indicates that what's happening is there are still new pe people who have been on for a long time are still quitting. There's still new quits happening later on, which is um, kind of an exciting thing because we don't see it for other sorts of smoking station medications. Okay, let's look at safety. Um, there were no treatment related serious adverse events, although, and they were pretty similar across groups. And um, the most common ones were um, uh, insomnia and abnormal dreams, which are also seen with varenicline. But what we didn't see was nausea. In fact, there was numerically, but not statistically, more nausea in the placebo groups. And that's really interesting because that's been a limiting factor for uh, varenicline and reported in some, of, in some of the other earlier trials. 
So obviously this trial, like all trials, has limitations. There's a limited number of non-white or Hispanic participants. There was an exclusion of people with serious cardiovascular disease, psychiatric illness, and current illicit substance use. And everybody got a lot of behavioral support. Weekly for 12 weeks is more than is likely to happen in the uh, real world of medical practice. So here is the paper, which was published just about a year ago. Um, and our conclusion was that this phase three multi-site placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial, the first large trial conducted in the U.S., showed that the novel regimen, along with behavioral support, had robust efficacy and excellent tolerability. And it was uh, accompanied by an editorial that basically said, you know, this is something that needs to get approved in the U.S. and we need this drug. Uh, and so that's where we were. Now, remember, I said that there were two trials. So the second, the company then had to follow that with a second trial, which has not been published, but has been sh the, has been presented as an abstracted SRNT last spring. Um, and so here are the results from that. Um, so let me orient you. On the left-hand side, we have our primary outcome, which are, let's, we're looking here just at the weeks nine to 12, but the data are essentially identical in the two groups. In the two, the two trials had almost the same results. Um, so I'm looking here at the nine to 12 weeks. And that one uh, shows you that there was a fairly similar result in ORCA-3, a slightly lower quit rate in the, um, in the, uh, in the nine, into nine to 12, in the second one. And in the, the secondary endpoint, which is going out to six months, almost the same numbers exactly and almost the same odds ratios. So that's where we are at this point. Um, two large US-based trials that have been um, show, uh, demonstrated to show efficacy. The second one needs to be written still um, and peer reviewed <laughs> beyond what you get um, for an abstract. And I'm gonna stop there and I'll be happy to take any questions and comments. And encourage the audience to think about what other studies would you need to do or are we done? Should Great. the FDA approve Great. this? Thanks so much, Dr. Rigotti. So uh, we're gonna go to our discussant, Dr. El uh, Halani, uh, who will have some comments and questions. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And uh, this is really interesting data and it's a pleasure to be discussing this work with you, Dr. Rigotti. So I sit on the other spectrum of tobacco control. I work more in policy and tobacco characters, tobacco product characteristics. So my questions will basically start there. So did you see a difference in terms of cessation between menthol smokers and non-menthol smokers? Uh, that's a good question. We did not have a lot of menthol smokers because we didn't have a lot of black people and that's mostly who smokes menthol in the United States. Um, so there was a little bit, a hint that there might be something going on with um, the menthol smokers maybe not doing quite as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we looked at the moderator analysis, and, but the numbers were so small that it, there were wide confidence limits. So it really didn't tell us anything. So with the second, second, you know, now we have two groups of data and, and you know, 1,600, 1,700 people. So we certainly want to look at that, but I don't have an answer yet for you. Yeah, and I imagine you will include race as an effect moderator as well. Because I saw yeah. in your paper that you included age, sex, and tobacco history, tobacco uses. Yeah, and so usually on when we look at the uh, tobacco-related health disparities, it's usually an inter intersection of racial minorities, but also lower socioeconomic status. So one of the things you mentioned before we started the talk is that it's approved right now in Australia. It's available in other countries. But the question here, should it be approved in the US as a prescribed drug, hence more controlled protocol, probably uh, like behavioral interventions as well, or it should be like something over the counter accessible to everybody, especially people that might not be able to see uh, healthcare providers on a regular basis? Yeah, you're raising a good question. And really, that's a question that would, should it be, if it's pers if it goes through the pathway that it's currently on with FDA, it's they're trying to get a, pr a prescription only um, because that's easier to get than a consumer, you know, a, a broader mm -hmm. one. So they're aiming to get that. Um, and if they get that, then it would make a lot of sense for them to think about trying to get an over-the-counter availability at some point. But that would be a later time, I would expect. 
Um, so if it's approved now, it would only be by by prescription. Okay, yeah, but I think for Achieve Life Sciences, being a 21st century company, that should be a next step to make it accessible to everybody. And I, yep. have, like, I have a third technical question kind of. So uh, you verified that they didn't relapse back to smoking using exhaled CO, right? But you didn't do any cotinine analysis to verify that they didn't use any other tobacco product. No, no. These people were primarily smokers only. It was not to, I'm trying to remember, I think they were not allowed to be using other kinds of tobacco, although I, I would need to check that for sure as an exclusion criteria, but almost everybody was a smoker. Okay. I mean, primarily a smoker. I don't think there was much other. There might have been one or two people that used a cigar. Yeah, it was smokeless. And partly that's, there wasn't a lot of smokeless use, in part because the parts of the country where this was done, if you remember the graph, it was mostly the southeastern U.S. where mm -hmm. there's a lot, um, where there's not as much smokeless use as there is sort of western and northwestern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in your exclusion criteria. One last question, Mike, about the half-life of cytosine. I think you mentioned somehow it's like 4.8 hours. Is this what uh, that it, like indicated the regimen to be three milligrams three times a day. Like, was this taken into consideration? Uh, you mean the fact that it's three times a day? Yeah. 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 Well, um, I mean, anyone of, you know, when we've, when I've talked to people in the pharmacy industry, they look at three times a day and they go, well, nobody's going to use this. Um, um, and I know, cause I recently had some eye surgery and had to put eye drops in three times a day. And let me tell you, I had to set the alarm so I keep my, to remember how to do that. Uh, so it's not an easy thing to do. A natural thing to, that the company would do, I would imagine, is um, is get a longer, a, figure out a long acting way to do it so it's a once a day drug. So mm -hmm. it could be a limiting factor. In the trials that we did, that there, that didn't happen, but people got emails and texts to remind them to use it. And maybe that would be something that might be part of the implementation process of using this, of this using this drug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll stop here because I think there's a question in uh, about like the heavy behavioral intervention to support the yeah. pharmacokinetics and the pharmacological effect of this. So Mike, I turn this to you to like just ask the questions that's in the chat. Yeah, thank you. We have we have a lot of questions in the Q and A. Um, I'll I'll start from the beginning, um, and, and a couple of them dovetail with things I wanted to ask anyway. So Cheryl Olson uh, brings up this question of of efficacy versus effectiveness, and um, it, you talked a little bit about how there's a lot of behavioral intervention with these in this in this trial, and so I immediately think of supply constraints and scaling these kind of things. Um, can you speak a little bit to the to the kind of uh, how physicians give some advice to physicians who are thinking about using this in the real world? Sure, um, I think that what we I mean uh, the point is that we've this these studies are demonstrating efficacy, not necessarily effectiveness as how it would show up as used in the United States if it were approved and available for physician prescription. So I think that that needs to be done. We need to figure out how much behavioral input do you need for this to be effective and what would, might be the best way to do it. It's clearly not going to be coming into the doctor's office every week. Um, it could be other ways it's like um, text messaging. It could be, um, uh, 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 there's, you know, that's like another, the next set of questions would be, how is the best way to use this? So there's a, another, another set of, of questions coming up. And in fact, I was going to make that point on the next slide. So you're, you guys are way ahead of me. Great. Um, just before we get to that, let me get a couple more out of the Q and A. Sure. Um, uh, Jonathan Fools asks about, uh, you know, how, do, how does this help like e-cigarette users to, to quit, does it? And, and, and my question was a little bit broader in thinking about any kind of complementarity between, between cytosine and other cessation devices. And uh, to the extent that you can study that, I think your exclusion criteria get rid of the e-cigarette users. But uh, more generally, do you have any sense on the complementarity there? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that uh, it, I mean, the, the way we think it works is by reducing withdrawal symptoms and by taking away some of the pleasures of, of having nicotine come into your body, and especially if it comes in quickly. 
And so, it, you know, it could be a, a drug for any kind of nicotine dependence. Um, and uh, in terms of the e-cigarettes, um, stay tuned. That's the next study. Okay. 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 Yeah. So we are, re we're really teeing you up. So maybe we'll let you go ahead and then we'll uh, come back to the Q&A later. Sure. Okay. Shall I keep going? Okay. So, um, you know, with this data, I've been sort of thinking about like, what are the next questions that we should, we should do? Um, and uh, a first category would be the effectiveness, not efficacy, but effectiveness and safety in populations that weren't in the randomized trials. And that could be groups with high smoking prevalence or groups that have had less success with current treatments. Um, so we clearly need to know how this performs in people who aren't white, in people who are Hispanic, and people have low income. What about with people who have comorbid substance use, other substance use disorders, mental health disorders, where our traditional medications do work but are have less efficacy? You know, will this maybe be more tolerable? So that's a huge piece of work that I think needs to be done. And that's not just one study. Um, another was efficacy in actual medical practice or effectiveness, excuse me, without the intensive behavioral support. And actually, um, a colleagues at Wisconsin and myself have put together and have submitted a trial um, to, N to, uh, to NIH to, uh, to do this kind of test to compare different levels of behavioral support um, for this medication. So maybe we'll get to see that. Um, then what about effectiveness and safety compared to other cessation medicines? You know, there's one trial that we discussed that says it's better than nicotine replacement. Um, but, you know, that was one trial done in mostly Maori people in New Zealand. Is that something that we would also see here in the United States um, or other, other parts of the world? Um, and uh, what about varenicline? How does it compare? They have a similar mechanism. Uh, the data have been pretty clear so far showing in the trials that have been done that it is uh, has fewer side effects than and is more tolerated than um, than varenicline. But, you know, how will it compare? Uh, there's been one trial done in Australia where they did a non-inferiority test to trial and it didn't quite make the non-inferiority margin, but it was pretty close. So that's still an open question. Um, and then nobody's compared it with bupropion. But I just saw last night that there's a trial that just came out from Thailand where the only other drug they have for smoking cessation is nortriptyline. And it's better, and 25 days of, of cytosine was better than, than three months of, of nortriptyline um, and had fewer side effects. So, you know, those things are starting and there are a lot of interesting questions there. Then the other would be interest, effectiveness in combination with other cessation medicines. You know, we combine, now we combine varenicline and nicotine replacement sometimes um, when people are on varenicline and they just can't quite completely get off cigarettes. Often NRT can help them and we combine others. You know, would we do that with um, for this medicine? Or as, as I think one of the questionnaires suggested, um, you know, what about, you know, adding, um, um, e-cigarettes to this or some combination of that. Um, and then effectiveness for nicotine dependence caused by other nicotine products. So that's where I want to go next. Um, and I asked the question of, you know, would it help for vaping cessation? So um, as I think everybody knows, uh, some of the people who use nicotine e-cigarettes want to stop and a lot of them find it hard. Not all, but many of them are having trouble doing so. And there's little evidence to guide treatment, especially drug treatment. Here's what uh, is out there. So varenicline was effective in one randomized control trial that was done in Italy in all former smokers and older people, not the young adults that we think about in terms of who's vaping in the United States and many other countries. But this was in a different population of people who'd switched probably more for health reasons, but it was effective in a small trial. Um, in the US, we don't have any FDA approved medicines for vaping cessation. In the UK, their equivalent of the FDA, the MHRA um, has licensed, has basically said that there's a nicotine 
mouth spray that's approved for smoking station, they said, well, if it works for smoking, it's probably reasonable for, for vaping. And so they've put that on as an additional indication without requiring extra studies. There actually isn't much out there about nicotine, uh, about NRT for vaping cessation, which you might think would be also something that we would be using. So we did a study that just came out um, a couple of months ago, hasn't been published on paper yet, uh, to do cytosinocline for vaping cessation. So this was a drug, uh, this was a trial that was um, funded by the NIDA and also by Achieve. So uh, this is going to look similar. It was to compare the efficacy and safety of 12 weeks of our new cytosinocline regimen versus placebo, both with behavioral support for vaping cessation. Um, so a double blind RCT, uh, it was a much smaller trial of aiming for 150 people with a two to one cytosinocline placebo ratio so they could get more information about safety um, and also your, make it easier to recruit. Everybody took one pill three times a day for 12 weeks. Everybody got weekly behavioral support and everybody was followed for an additional four weeks after stopping treatment. So that's the structure. Um, the age, it was, everyone was an adult. Um, you had to be daily using a nicotine e-cigarette, but not cigarette smoking. You could have been a former smoker, but you could not have be a current smoker. So you had to have a CO, an expired air CO that was less than nine. And to show that you weren't smoking nicotine, but that you had enough nicotine that it, you in your saliva that you uh, would have a, a level greater than 30 nanograms per ml for a, one of those dipstick tests. And you will have to want to stop vaping um, within a few within two weeks of starting treatment. You had to be medically and psychiatric, psychiatrically stable. It was very similar criteria to ORCA2. Um, and you had to have a negative urinary screen for drugs of abuse, again, but we didn't test for cannabis, and we had a lot of discussion about whether we should allow people who are also using often smoking cannabis into the trial or not, and um, decided in the end that um, while there would be greater internal validity uh, if we uh, excluded people who are cannabis users, there would be a lot less um, external validity or generalizability, and it might be hard to actually recruit them because there's um, among the, po the population we expected, which were going to be younger adults, that we thought there was probably going to be a lot of cannabis use. So we, we allow cannabis users. Uh, what we did is discourage them and, from using it and ask them to switch, if possible, to a non-smoked form of cannabis so that it didn't screw up our results. Um, so, uh, the primary outcome was biochemically verified continuous abstinence with a cotinine less than 10 nanograms per ml in the last four weeks of treatment, weeks 9 through 12. The secondary outcome was would it last an additional four weeks, so would it would go from week 9 to week 16. And then we also looked at the seven-day point prevalence, e-cigarette vaping abstinence. We also um, looked at whether people relapsed to smoking, which I didn't put on here. Um, as well, because there has been some concern that if you if you take people who are vapors, especially those who used to be smokers, and you and you try to get them off vaping, they might relapse to smoking. We also looked for safety, adverse events, and uh, made the same assumption that if we had missing data on you, we assumed you were vaping. Uh, this was done in five sites across the United States, and done later in 2022, and. Uh, here's the consort diagram. So we recruited 160 people in a two to one ratio. And importantly, we stratified by history of smoking because we thought that that might be an important confounding or moderating factor. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we had similar numbers in both groups. Um, and we had the same uh, pretty high completion rates of 84% for 12 weeks and 82 per 16 weeks. Here's our sample. Uh, which looks different. Um, the age was 34 on average. Um, and uh, again, it was a, a, li a little bit more women than men. Uh, it was an, it was an almost entirely white sample. Um, but I think the context for that in part is that white people are 
use it or have a higher prevalence of e-cigarette use than other um, racial and ethnic groups at the moment in the United States. 72% um, uh, met our criteria for having been smokers in the past, but defined as they had had 100 cigarettes in their life. Most of them had start, had quit smoking uh, about two years ago. And, and uh, let's see, the age of first e-cigarette use, the median was 25, basically 25, 26. Um, but the range was broad from 12 to 60. So it's it's quite a wide range. Um, if you look at the device types that they were using, um, mostly it's a range, but there was a lot of disposable use. There'd probably be more disposable use if it was done now. Um, and then the other thing that we found was that adults like children, like kids, um, prefer flavors to tobacco flavored products. So this was our sample and here's the result. So first let's look at the left-hand side. This is our primary outcome. And uh, this is um, no evidence of, this is potenine verified um, abstinence at uh, weeks nine to 12. And that was 32% in the cytosinicline group, 15% in the placebo group. So about a doubling. Um, and you can see the odds ratio there. So that was statistically significant um, in this smaller sample of 160 people. And then the secondary outcome, uh, there was still um, a difference, but it was no longer statistically significant with our sample size. Um, and you can see that here. This is looking at the point prevalence, similar to the graph I showed before. And you can see that it's not as much different as it was in the previous um, one, but there still is, it certainly looks like throughout, there's more uh, uh, abstinence at all points in the cytosinicline group. Um, not as much of a, of, an, of a clear evidence of things going up uh, beyond, you know, beyond eight weeks or so. And there, is only, there isn't a short version here. So it's not quite as impressive for that. And here are the adverse events. We had no serious adverse events, um, thanks frankly to the fact that it's a younger population that doesn't have a lot of chronic diseases already. Um, the, there were similar numbers with uh, treatment emergent events, mostly were mild. And the common ones were abnormal dreams and insomnia, nausea again, was less common than in the placebo group. Um, so that's what we saw, pretty good, pretty excellent tolerability. I think I don't have a slide for looking at, did people relapse, but we did look at that. And um, it looked like there was a small proportion of people that relapsed back to smoking in both groups, but it was not higher in the groups that were randomized to cytosinicline than to placebo. Um, so our limitation, again, not a lot of non-white or Hispanic participants, not people with serious illnesses. Um, everybody got a lot of behavioral support and only adults were eligible. So we certainly cannot generalize these to adolescent vapors, but that would be an interesting group to test. So our conclusions were that cytosinicline at this dose for 12 weeks combined with behavioral support was well tolerated and more effective than placebo to help e-cigarette users to stop vaping at the end of treatment, but we clearly didn't show that it lasted with our sample. We need larger and longer duration trials to confirm whether this really is effectiveness beyond the end of treatment. And um, that if that's the case, then cytosine might offer adults an option to treat nicotine dependence due to e-cigarette use and perhaps other kinds of nicotine dependence, but that would be another study. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of put this into perspective now, um, which is just what else is out there? Um, so there actually are two um, systematic reviews of this very limited evidence. Um, and so the Cochrane Review did a, did, um, uh, uh, looked at cytosine for smoking cessation. So let me, let's go back and we're now not talking about vaping cessation. Now we're talking about smoking cessation. So for cytosine, where does it stand? So there were a few trials then they found that cytosine was more effective than placebo uh, or no medicine and was well tolerated. There were only four trials. 
Uh, it was more effective than NRT, but only one trial that you've seen already. Um, and it might be comparable in effectiveness to varenicline, but it, all, in all of the, the two trials that were done, it had fewer side effects. So that's kind of where we were. Um, I would have said last week, that's where we are. Um, it didn't have our most recent trial in there. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, the another another systematic review came out. Um, and this was done, um, funded by the WHO, done by a group in um, Australia of, of, of data scientists who um, uh, included more studies because they had an extra year of data. And so they showed that there the cytosine was more effective than placebo. There were more trials, two more trials and a higher odds, uh, relative risk. Uh, the cytosine versus NRT, I guess there was one more trial and they looked at cytosine versus renaclin and their conclusion was it's more effective than placebo, no medicine, usual care and NRT. They were silent about varenicline, about its role for varenicline. They said it's pretty well tolerated and the WHO guidelines, which just came out in, I think it was um, July 3rd, uh, basically included cytosine as one of the, um, as, a, as a medicine for smoking cessation, along with nicotine replacement, uh, varenicline and bupropion. So that's where we are at the moment. Okay, what about in the US? So what's gonna happen? So the FDA, um, the, the results were presented by the company to the FDA in, the tip, in a meeting. And the FDA said, gee, that data looks pretty good on efficacy, but we would like more safety data. This is a we have we want to see people to know that people can use this for a year and still be okay because we suspect that people will use it more than once uh, because we're dealing with a recurring uh, di uh, dis a disorder that is re a relapsing recurring disorder. Um, so uh, the company has had to uh, do a new they're now doing a new non randomized safety study where they're just giving the drug um, open label to people and it's a pure safety study to be able to show that um, that it is safe to use for a year. Um, and they're planning to submit the new drug application to the FDA in the first half of 2025, according to their website. Um, I When I heard this, I was, um, I was disgruntled uh, because it seemed to me that we had pretty good data and we had um, a, a lot of of information about a drug that's been on the market for a long time. It didn't seem likely that there would be so much trouble, uh, that there was gonna be a hidden side effect that we didn't know about. And that, you know, a half a million people almost die every year in the United States of smoking and we need something to treat them. Um, and so I worked with the modelers in my uh, group, specifically Krishna Reddy, who's in our um, modeling group and um, asked the question of, how many years of life are lost by a year's delay in the um, approval of cytosine in the United States? And um, we came up with a number and um, and that was, we just got that paper accepted, but I can't tell you about it until it, the embargo drops, but that's coming. Um, so that's that. All right, so whoops. so. Um, so, so I think what's coming down the pike is that cytosinicline might be approved for marketing in the U.S. as early as 2026, probably not before, but that's not sounding so far away anymore. Um, it's going to be a prescription drug only. Um, and the question of should it be an OTC eventually was already brought up and would be a probably, I think it would be a reasonable candidate. I know they that Pfizer tried to get an OTC designation for varenicline, and I assume that they were not, not successful because it never happened. Um, it will be a brand name drug, and you might say, well, how can it be a brand name drug? And the company has patents on its three milligram tablet and dose and the TID dosing. So in theory, if you want to use that, you have to use the brand name drug. I don't know how that's actually going to play out. Um, and then there's the question of what is the drug going to cost in the U.S. and what it's going to cost elsewhere. Um, they have been willing to talk about uh, their very. That's the usually the last um, the last piece of information that a drug company will ever tell you about a drug that's in development. 
Um, so I don't know, but um, uh, but I think that they have been willing to think about two tier pricing so that there could be a perhaps a lower price for um, low and middle income countries. Um, and it needs to have a reasonable price if we want lower price, if we want it to really reduce our socioeconomic disparities in tobacco treatment, access and success and quit and um, population smoking rates or tobacco use rates. So that's where I'm gonna stop and I'd be happy to take any questions and thanks very much. Okay, we'll go back to Dr. Al-Halai. Yeah, uh, another interesting study, a new drug for a new problem as vaping is taking over the population. But I was really interested and like really uh, kind of intrigued by the fact that some of the people in the vaping trial relapsed back to smoking, although they are former smokers. Do you have any like uh, explanation in terms of pharmacology, what happened in the receptors, why they went, didn't go back to vaping and they went all the way back to smoking? Um, well, I think that uh, that most of them, when we talked to them, would say it was stress. They went through some stressful event, and uh, then they, you know, went back to something that they were comfortable with. Um, maybe they would have stayed vaping if they were vaping and they were off of it. Um, I think that there's a a lot of back and forth between, you know, nicotine dependence. There's probably going to be a certain amount of back and forth. I think what was um, encouraging was that it wasn't very much that went back. It was, I, I I wish I could remember the number exactly. It's in the paper, but- um, Maybe like 15. It, huh? Maybe you wrote like 15% or something like that. Okay, yeah, it's, you know, it's more than you'd like, but it's not enough to suggest that you're probably gonna lose the benefit of trying mm -hmm. to help people come off vapes. But it, it does raise a question that you need to not push going off vapes too quickly. I think that, Clinically, what we tell people is that, um, at least the way that I think about it is, you know, we don't know the long-term effects of vaping, but certainly the short-term effects are a lot better than smoking. So, but if, but, you know, at some point when you are solidly off cigarettes and you're not, you have the identity of a non-smoker, then it is probably time to switch over. But I don't push it too hard because we know that people can stay on vaping for a while and nicotine is a is a very depend it has a high dependence characteristics yeah and i think my next question is something you already alluded to is do you think like it's like realistic to imagine some kind of a phased approach to phase smoking out of the population so we take them out of smoking first to e-cigarette use or some harm reduction approach and then we use something like cytosine to take them off vaping. Do you think this is feasible? Um, I think, yeah, I think it, I mean, I think that would be a good strategy. I mean, I think that if we can get people to completely quit without having to go through the vaping phase, that's great, but not everybody's going to do that. And right now we don't have much to offer those people and they just keep smoking and we, we just feel frustrated. Oh, well, in medicine, we feel frustrated when they come to see us. Um, and so we don't have much to offer them. Yeah, I think that that's, a, that's quite a vision that we should have. It, because it was interesting in your sample size that 98 out of 160 quit smoking by using e-cigarette. So then when you offered them cytosine, they quit vaping as well, like a, a substantial percentage of them. Yeah. So that's interesting for me. But these were all people who had that they wanted to quit vaping. Mm -hmm. um, and not all vapors are there at there are there yet. But I, I mean there were two groups. There was a group that were new smokers. I just know from talking to some of the patients that were in our study that um, I was really surprised because we in Boston we have a lot of college students and there were a bunch of college students who had never used tobacco as high school students. Everybody's very worried about the use of vaping and cigarettes and well not cigarettes anymore, vaping in high schools. These kids had not, they uh, had not smoked or vaped in high school. They got to college and they found other people vaping and they, they tried it out and they got stuck in college. So I was kind of surprised because this was like more like people who were 19, 20, um, where we don't worry so much about the smoking, but now we have to worry about the vaping. Yeah, so my, my last question is, 
particularly about that. Do you have plans to like start a new clinical study on uh, adolescents and young adults that are e-cigarette exclusive users that have never used any other tobacco product? Um, they can quit vaping using cytosine. Uh, we we don't, um, but I think that's a trial that should should be done. Um, I think that what Achieve is planning to do is to do a larger trial of adults for vaping cessation to try to get that indication for adults and then would probably go and try to get one for kids as well. Um, it's just harder to do those trials because of the consent issues involved. Um, but I think that that would be a very reasonable thing to do. Yeah, thank you so much, great work. Thank you for the good questions. So we have a few more questions in the, the Q&A, um, and one that I want to highlight from uh, Tony Astrin, uh, something I was thinking about as well, um, is given that these smokers are, you know, pack-a-day smokers is 20 times a day that they're they're lighting up a cigarette. Um, did you get any kind of qualitative information from some of your started study participants about the trade-off but three times a day use of cytosine maybe keyed them in to their quit their quit journey their quit quit attempt and in some sense actually doing it more having to do it more than once or twice a day was actually beneficial in some way. Oh, well, that's a really interesting idea. I hadn't thought of it. I like it. I I think it might maybe these people who are used to doing something on a regular basis and the habitual nature of it. You know, it's it's yeah. it's, it's something that they go to. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was one. Um, and then, um, so uh, Carol, Carol Dressler has, has a question about medical marketing and, and how, so how is a small pharma company, how are they going to do the medical marketing required to get physicians to prescribe the drug? That's an excellent question and nobody knows the answer That's uh, to that. I think that realistically, the company will either, um, will probably have to get bought out by somebody or will have to get merge with a, a company, um, but they're probably, I mean, they're small, so they would probably get bought out by somebody um, who has the capacity to do the marketing. They're beginning to sort of try to um, ramp up and get the capacity themselves, but that's, that's you know, it's, it's one set of skills to get a drug through the FDA approval process. It's quite another set of skills to um, market it in the US, and so, I think that is a question. That's how it's going to play out. Um, one question uh, I just have about the kind of the absence of new innovations in this space. You know, you, you spoke about that at the beginning. I mean, so is this a, is this an economic problem in the sense that the the incentives just aren't there because smoking is going down in this country, or is it a is it a scientific problem? Uh, where where do you see? Maybe if you could just kind of uh, uh, you know uh, speak a little bit about that. Where do you see the where do you see the bottleneck in, in innovation with respect to to cessation tools? I think that the bottleneck has been the um, the fear of the pharmaceutical companies. Of I think that you know varenicline was a very high profile. It started out. It looked like it was going to be this huge drug, and then it just the the demand collapsed after there was this concern about. Um, psychiatric side effects, and it, the companies spent a lot of money, and you know, and eventually were able to show that it wasn't any more risky than anything else we're using for smoking cessation. But I think that that with these kinds of things, I think there's always this concern that you know you're messing around with receptors in the brain. Are you going to be changing behavior? Mm -hmm. There have been other drugs. I worked with a drug called Ramonabant many years ago, which was going to help people quit smoking, treat their diabetes, and lower their cholesterol or raise their HDL cholesterol. And it never, it didn't make it through because there were some, the FDA was concerned about the amount of um, depression symptoms that were showing up. So I think it's a lot had been a fear of that. The other part of the problem has been the FDA has not been very willing to be, cre to be creative on that side. I know that, for example, there are some people who are now developing products to try to go through the med medicinal side of FDA that will deliver nicotine, be nicotine inhalers, but truly inhalers, not like the one we have, um, that will actually essentially deliver nicotine to the lungs to give you the rapid rise in blood nicotine levels that that is what addiction is all about, but not as much as a cigarette and not by heating anything so that there isn't a lot of other stuff in there like there is for nicotine um, 
that there is for, for vaping, for e-cigarettes. And so there are a number of smaller companies that, that are startups that are trying to work in that area and actually go to the medicinal side of FDA to see if they could get, a, get it. Now, whether they'll be able to do it uh, is a big question. But so that I think is an exciting area, which ironically could put e-cigarettes out of business. If you had a better nicotine inhaler, that- yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you so much. We're we're out of time, so I'm going to kick it back to Sam uh, Sturm to to take us out. Uh, so we're now at the end of today's session. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Rigotti, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following Select Tops seminars this season. Uh, to join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave the webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, uh, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting. That is B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash tops meeting, all lowercase. Uh, thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to our audience of 171 people for your participation today. Have a tops notch weekend. <laughs>